What keeps you going? What keeps you on that path? Our people, whānau, um, a vision for Rangatiratanga, a vision to get our land back, a vision for our reo to be spoken every day by our people and heard every day, a vision for this country to be grounded in tikanga and mātauranga, no different to a vision our tūpuna had with Te Tiri Te mm. You know, a big vision, a vision of Tino Ranga Tiratanga and um, reclaiming Aotearoa as Māori, as iwi, as hapu, as whānau. So that's the kind of vision I have, that's what drives me. Today's episode is with an academic researcher who has dedicated her life to the advancement of Māori and all Indigenous peoples all over the world. We took a deep dive into kaupapa Māori and leadership. This isn't a research project or topic of study for her. This is her way of life. This is Leone Pihama, Indigenous 100. Et kura, Leone Tenawe. Associate Professor Dr. Leonie Pihamarana. I always get confused which one I have to use. Yeah, Professor. Professor, Professor, right, yeah. Professor. Yeah. Just for you. <laughs> te ahorangi te Thank you for being a part of Indigenous 100. What does Professor Leonie Pihaman do nowadays? What do I do? I was wondering what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I had a funny feeling you were meant to work for Kaitahu. Um, what do I do? So uh, I'm doing a lot of things. I mean, you know, research, kind of Māori, um, thinking, you know, and practice. That's kind of what I do in really general terms. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, over and above the work, um, you know, I've got my six tamariki and now five mokupuna. So I'm really uh, moving into a kind of queer nanny role, which is a really beautiful place to be yeah. uh, in terms of whānau. And, you know, so that's all kind of, all together, that's really what informs what I do in terms of the work I do. Yeah, um, yeah so, I, you know, I was at Waikato University for about eight years, uh, directing Te Kotahi Research Institute there, uh, which was a real honour uh, for me to do. And then in the last six months, I've moved to doing more mahi at home again, doing the kind of work that I want to do, more in Taranaki, a lot around you know, Māori well-being, and uh, working part-time at uh, Ngā Waia Tatui, which is an institute at Unitec with Jenny Lee Morgan. Mm. So, you know, a lot of little bits of th pieces, really, a, a lot of research work. Um, and you've been doing it for a long time. I, th I think you, do, you got your Masters, your, was it your MA first class on as 93? Mm, yes. Is that right? 1993. You've been reading a CV, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it's called research, not <laughs> something I'm given to, oh, okay. as you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but that is a long time. Yeah. 27 years, 30 years actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. when you yeah. take it into account when you started, actually more than 30 years. What keeps you going? What keeps you on that path? Our people. Whānau. Um, a vision for Rangatiratanga a vision to get our land back, a vision for our reo to be spoken every day by our people and heard every day, a vision for this country to be grounded in tikanga and mātauranga. I mean, I have that vision that's no different to the vision, I think, that, um, you know, uh, our people, your people in the north are uh, laid out with te in the declaration, that vision for our people, no different to a vision our tūpuna had with te tiri te mm. You know, a big vision a vision of Tino Ranga Tiratanga and um, reclaiming Aotearoa as Māori, as iwi, as hapu, as whānau. So that's the kind of vision I have, that's what drives me. Um, how, do you, how do you give effect to that day by day, week by week? Is there a way that, do, do you set up a plan that says, okay, th this is what I will achieve to, you know, in this day that gives effect to Tino Ranga Tiratanga. And I know people look at their families when they talk about that and, and obviously your six tamariki and mokupuna and say that's, that's the, the, the way I can give a substantive outcome to Tino Ranga Tiratanga for everyone is by first of all starting with my family. And I know you'll talk about that, but how do you, from a wider perspective, give effect to that, that, that role and aspiration that you have? 
Um, <clears throat> well, I don't really, to be honest, I don't think about it every day. It's just something that's kind of embedded in, in how I move in the world now, I think. Um, you know, 30 years of doing this work, as work, um, and being around people who, <clears throat> you know, are activists, who are iwi people, who are the old people, who are tikanga people, who are constantly living this every day of their lives. You know, it tends to rub off yeah. and how you might think about things and how you might do things. So really, um, trying to live in my life in a way that aligns with tikanga as much as I can, I, I think that's what it is. And when I look at <clears throat> you know, a lot of the work we're doing in areas like family violence and colonial impact and trauma, um, what we see often in that, you know, for our people in that space is that disconnect, the disconnection from tikanga, the disconnection from whānau, from whenua, from reo, all those things. And so trying to live in a way that is connected more um, has been something I've been working on for a long time, and people around me have been working on for a long time. Yeah. So it's not something I do alone, it's something I do with all of the people in my life, um, you know, with my partner, with my children, with my mokopuna, with my whānau, with my friends, colleagues, you know, really working to think how do we re, how do we uplift tikanga in our lives, how do we uplift te Māori in our lives, mātauranga Māori in our lives, and make it a priority. So it's really conscious in some ways and kind of not conscious in other ways. Yeah. Um, like for example, you know, when we do karakia, you know, when I first started learning to the old Māori, I had to think about that all the time. I had to think, you have to do karakia, and this is a karakia you need to do. You know, do one for kai if you're doing for kai, you know, whatever. And I would have to think about that. I think now it's just a part of our daily lives and, you know, having been a part of kohanga, having been a part of Kura Kaupapa Māori, having been a part of Mene Reo, you know, Kura Reo, and, and a whole range of whānau and hapu and iwi, uh, hui. It becomes a part of your life, so you don't have to think about it. And, you know, when I'm thinking about karakia, I remember many years ago being at a Kura Reo in all, at Oi, at Waitara, with Huirangi and um, you know, we would have this thing of seven o'clock, a group would get up and do karakia, and you would do karakia for everyone, which is fabulous, you know. But I do remember him saying at one point, you don't have to do it like that all the time. You can wake up and tuku karakia for yourself. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. We don't have to wait for someone else. Here, he, mātanga reo, he, mātanga karakia, ki a karakia atu. Me karakia, kātika. Yeah. Um, and so, really being taking control of that in their own lives and you know with him passing during COVID which is, is a huge loss uh, for Tadanaki but for the motu and for the world um, those kinds of insights I think from people like him come back and I guess as you get older you know just become a part of how you think about the world oh I, I absolutely agree I mean I, I uh, not just his passing but passing during COVID and not having that ability to uh, enact, to put into practice those things that he taught, you know, a lot of people, not, not just Taranaki Mana, you know, involved in broadcasting, we always, we almost called him Godfather, you know, for us, for us in Māori broadcasting, he, he was kind of it for us, you know? And to not be able to kind of enact that felt a bit like, actually, disconnection, you know, which may be the wrong way of putting it, but I, I you know, as you know, we had an opportunity to try and reflect that in a way through a couple of platforms and stuff, but it's still feeling like we weren't able to be who we are, who we should be, our ability to engage with each other, and his, and obviously his whānau, but to show him all that he taught people when in his life, just felt really kind of, oh, I felt really kind of impacted by it, but actually, and I'm sure you did as well, and you're right, we lose yeah. that, that unique, and it was a unique perspective that he had, actually. It, it, it is. Yeah. Um... How do people like that inform your work in Kaupapa Māori and, and also work that you do in, 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 in Manawahine theory? And we'll get into the particulars of that, but how, how, did the, how did those people who inspired you, who motivated you, impact the work that you do? Oh, entirely. Entirely. I mean, there are many like Huirangi. Um, too many to name, you know. And so, uh, Māori nei, I won't main, name them. But, the you know, the ability to fight not only for te reo 
and to stand up not only for te reo, but to stand up for your whenua, to stand up for your tikanga, um, to stand up for your people, to stand up for rangatiratanga. Um, and that is, you know, I think often what happens is that we compartmentalise these things. Like you're a real person, you know, you're a health person, uh, you're an activist, you're a this, you're a that. And we compartmentalise people's roles for us as Māori. And, and often we don't want to move between those roles or take on multiple roles because, you know, the work is huge in every single one of those areas, right? Um, but then there are people who do all of those things and they do all of them because it's an embedded, inherent part of who they are as a person. Mm. So um, it's, it's quite a unique person, I think, that can stand up across and uplift across all of those things for Māori. At a whānau level, a hapu level, an iwi level, an international level, but also not just be slotted into, you're a mātanga reo and that's what you do, yeah. you know, or you're a karakia expert and that's what you do. But actually to be able to take those things and combine them across fighting for your land, standing up for rangatiratanga, all those things. I think it's quite a unique kind of person that can do that. Yeah. Um, and I think that we are, we are compartmentalised, and I think that's a very colonial thing, and we need to. Think well, about I was going to say, I was going to say, where did that come from? Because we're very quick to label people, and you're right, you, you yeah. use compartmentalised, but I also think it's labelling, right? Because it, I don't know whether it's convenient or whatever it is, whether we're just so kind of <sighs> acclimatised to colonisation or whatever it might be that we are quick to do that ourselves. Now, in fact, sometimes we're Western Pakeha doing it to ourselves. Well, you know, I think that it is a very colonial thing to, to make silos of knowledge like that. So you have all these different silos of knowledge. And one of the things that's been really clear to me, uh, particularly in the last five years, looking at what is healing from something like family violence, right? From, and, and family violence, including the, the violence of the state on our whānau, not just between ourselves, but the violence we feel and is impacted on us from the Crown. So when we think about healing from that, one of the things that's become very, very clear is that if we don't connect tikanga and veil to that healing, that healing will only go so far. It will only go so far. And so we need everybody to come together. If we're talking about healing for Māori, if we're talking about being able to uplift ourselves fully, we need everyone to be able to do that together. So we need all of the real people to work with the Māori health providers together you know, to work with those who are working in homelessness together to reconnect, to reconnect us on every level. Because connecting, connecting culturally is not enough if you don't have a home, and we know that. We can have all of these connections, but be homeless, or be, in, or, or be in a violent relationship. So they all have to come together. It's like the synergy across everything. And for me, that's what mātauranga is. When I think about mātauranga Māori, and when I think about kaupapa for Māori, um, <clears throat> it's around all of these things coming together in a synergy so that we can feel more whole. Mm. And that's something that you know, Mason will talk about in, say, te whare tapawha. You know, all of these components of ourselves coming together. I think one of the things around that notion or that model that he has is also that we sit on whenua, so then we also have to connect it to the whenua. A whare can't stand alone, it has to be connected. So what happens when you want to reconnect to whenua, but you have none? Or you want to reconnect to whenua, but you don't know your hapu? Um, and so we can do a whole range of healing, but it has to have a, uh, a whole holistic or a kind of full picture to it. Um, so really we're starting to say, well, healing family violence requires those who are doing te reo Māori to work with people who experience violence and to give them the kupu, to give them the reo, to give them the language to reconnect them. And then they also have to be connected to people working in you know, areas of homes and homelessness. Yeah. So we need everything. Uh, and, and, and the thing is, it's everything our tūpuna had. So really we're returning to an old way of being in a contemporary context. Yeah. So how in a contemporary context do we do that? How do we live our lives? And, and you can only, I think, start day by day by being very conscious of it, 
what is our behaviour? I've become more and more, as I get older, increasingly aware of the bad behaviours that I have. They're not, not grounded and don't align to tikanga. You know, and calling myself on them and being called on it. So how do I change, with all of the learning I've had, the kind of behaviours that I exhibit mm. that come from a whole range of places, come from having experienced and seen family violence growing up, come from having a range of different traumatic events in my life, um, <clears throat> having been raised very individualistic, you know, in my thinking, because that's what academics are trained to be, right? The one. Uh, and to move away from that and to reflect on my own behaviours and my own relationships. And so, you know, and increasingly the more I work in this area, the more I see that there are some quite fundamental things we all need to do yeah. to change. But that, that takes a lot of, not only self-reflection, but vulnerability. You've got, you've got to be, you've got to be able to, to, to show your vulnerability not only for yourself, but actually to others, so that you can either either provide help to provide afi or to have or to receive afi from others mm -hmm. who can actually help. How do, how do we do that? And, and and is there a way that we can do that, that that enables us to be able to get outcomes, the likes of which that you're talking about now? Because mm. it's not easy. Yeah, yeah, and you know, kind of vulnerabilities, you know, the kind of in word at the moment, yeah. I think. Uh, and it, it has some opening connotations to it and it has some very demeaning connotations to it. So, um, such as when the, you know, the ministry decided that it would be the Ministry for Vulnerable Children yeah, yeah. and those children were primarily Māori, yeah. which kind of puts us not in a notion of opening ourselves to thinking, but in uh, you know, a very deficit place of being. Um, so I tend not to think really about in that terms, but I think it's, you know, people use the term decolonisation in a very general way and um, and it's become the kind of word you use where you're talking about anything, making anything more Māori or more Indigenous, which is true, you know, that's part of it. But actually, inherent to that idea is actually being able to reflect and to um, see the parts of our lives that have been very influenced by colonial thinking. And, and it's every part of our life, every part of our life for every Māori person. There is not one Māori person living that has not had this impact on them. With Kohanga Reo Kura Kaupapa Māori, we're trying to minimise and reduce the impact. And I think we have, when we look at the Rokura that have, have graduated from those contexts, I think that we've, over a number of generations, you know, in 30 years, done a pretty good job. However, there are still things that happen outside of a kura context that, we're, that, that they have to deal with. So we have to be able to, I think, reflect on what are the things that impact on our lives daily and how do we respond to them and where does that response come from? So for example, um, the term aroha, which you know, has many meanings for us, right? Uh, and I remember when I first really thought about that term and I thought about that notion, me aro te ha, me aro kwe, and there was a saying, me aro kwe ki te ha o hini a hoone. But it's bigger than that, you know, uh, that within the kupu aroha, ka aro taku ha, ki tō ha, hey. And there's something in that relationship that is very deeply Māori because of what ha means for us and that breath. You don't share your breath, you don't uddle your ha or te tahi hoariri, right? Mm. Why would you do that? Mm. So there's something about the, that form of relationship. But now we see aroha as some kind of Valentine's idea, Valentine's Day, red roses, red flowers. Um, you know, Hollywood notion of love. And it's become very distorted how we might think about it. Now this is just one kupu. So this is how big it is, right? Mm. So if we think about aroha in that way, and in our relationships with each other, think about aroha as being this kind of Hollywood, Americanized Valentine's Day notion of love, then that comes with a whole lot of cultural baggage yeah. in terms of how we relate and expectation yeah. uh, in terms of how we relate. And I don't think it embodies the aro or the ha or the mana or the tapu that is a part of how we 
our tupuna thought about that term aroha. Because you're not, you're not talking about complete reformation yeah. or no. even reinvigoration. It's, it's contextualisation, right? Everything. Yeah. It's everything. Which is why te del Māori is so important, right? Yeah. But not just te del Māori for the sake of speaking te del Māori, which is why people like Huirangi and, and, you know, and Timote and Rose Perry and others you know, of that generation have been so powerful in how they articulate to their Māori because they're challenging us to think about every kupu we say in te reo Māori and what it means and it has a meaning. Because we can translate to their Māori really badly in a very colonial way. Yeah. And actually that happens a lot. Yeah. And we have to see a lot of that on Māori TV. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we we also see a lot of that in Māori books, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. that where the translation is translated in a very English Western thinking uh, model. Uh, and, you know, if we continue to do that, we're not actually doing the decolonising that the, the reo can actually do for us. Yeah. So there's a kind of reo Māori, thinking Māori, whakāro Māori, that actually is not only a re-indigenising of ourselves, yeah, taking back our tanga, te whenua tanga, yeah. uh, but it's also, it also contributes to a decolonising agenda. I see this a lot, I mean, I, I spent a bit of time with, oh, with Margie's with Margie's dad, with, with Uncle, oh. Uncle Patu, and um, I find people like that, you talked about huirangi, you know, Uncle Pat for us is, is one of those kinds of people, there aren't many of them le left mm. now, right? And, um, and it blows me away because the, the there's a, there's a little bit of it's practical application, right? So, you, you know, there are, there are tikanga and words that actually come from mahinga kai, you know, māra. And if you take those words out of their context, that you're, you're absolutely right. Without that context, they mean something completely, mm. completely different. My, my concern, though, is, is that do you think we have both the capability and capacity to do that now? And is it sustainable? Because, as I say, people like that are very few and far between mm. Now, you know, and it, it becomes a, a real hard job. It's a, it's a major mission to try and reinvigorate that, you know, to reconstitute those, those numbers. Of people. I, I mean, I think we do have it. Yeah. I think we do have it. I think we have a generation we, uh, of people that are doing that. I think we have Pania Papa, we have Ruikiri, we have yourself, we have Paraone, we have a whole range of people, Leon. Um, <clears throat> and then we have these people who are still with us, you, you yeah. know, the Rose Petties and the Path Weepers, yeah. that, you know, we need to continue as you're doing Wananga in the North continue to wānanga with them uh, and make the most of the time that they have to share with us these whakaro. But also we have to be more reflective in our own selves, I think, around when we are approaching particular kaupapa uh, and reflecting on the kind of source of the understanding that we have in a particular whether it be a particular kupu or a particular event. So I think we do have the capacity, I think we have the capability. I think it's working, and as I said, it's actually about working together, yeah. not necessarily working in silos. Um, I'd like to see Te Reo Māori Wānanga happen inside every health provider, because actually that is one of the most reconnecting things we can do mm. with our people, is give them the language to understand the feelings that they have that may not align to an English the English understandings that they're living in or the world that they're living in. And you can change that very, very quickly. Um, and I know that from my own experience, and you would know that from your own experience, growing up without Te Reo Māori and then accessing this incredible world of knowledge that we didn't have initially, yeah. that it can change your life. When did that life-changing moment come for you? I mean, I know you've, you spoke very briefly about your upbringing and the trauma that you saw within the community that you were brought up in. When did that life-changing moment occur for you and how did it happen? I mean, in my, you know, so I was born and raised in Waitara. And as you know, Waitara has its own history uh, in terms of imperialism and colonialism and invasion and destruction all around Taranaki, all around the Maunga. And that there is a lot of healing happening for our people um, in spite of the ongoing oppression by the Crown, I will say. Uh, which continues to this day. So if you understand kind of historical trauma, then you understand that our tūpuna have experienced particular things that within our whakapapa, e roto te i tangata, he wānanga. Mm. Eh? And so within that wānanga, we hold certain things. So we hold a trauma of things that they experience which have not been healed. So part of our job, I think, our generation, is to heal that so that we don't pass it to our tamariki and mokupuna. 
And I think that is a very big role for the current kind of 40s to 60 generation at the moment, is that we have a healing role to do. Um, <clears throat> so that our children, our mokopuna, don't have to carry what we've had to carry in our lives and what our parents carried. So there's that, there's all of that, but there's also, we also, through that, through our whakapapa, we also get the joyousness of our tūpuna, and we get the hope and we get the vision of our tūpuna. And they're kind of all meshed together. And so, growing up in Waitara and experiencing um, really being a second-class citizen on your own land. So, so living in, with a whānau who paid lease on stolen land that was stolen three times from your own iwi and paying lease for 50, 60 years. And now being told we have to buy it back as a whānau. You know, that's an ongoing trauma. Um, <clears throat> and so kind of living with that stuff and then also living with a whole range of incredible experiences of being Māori. So when I went to school, which was a very long time ago, uh, <laughs> um, you know, Kui uh, Fiddle Bailey was, this, was a high school teacher at Waitala High School. Wow. Yeah, in the early 80s, 70s and 80s. She had, uh, with the then principal, who was a British principal, they had did El Māori as compulsory in Form 3. Wow. Yeah. And, and very few people will reflect on that. I didn't know that. And it was huge. Yeah. <clears throat> and so she was my first Māori language teacher. I never continued after that, after that uh, experience of that particular class uh, for me. But <clears throat> what it meant is that there were these little things along the way that kind of kept telling you you're Māori, mm. kept telling you you're Te Atiawa, you're from here. The marae's on there, you know, you walk through the marae to get to school. So, so there's always that kind of ongoing to and froing around how you experience life as a Māori person. But I also walked to school and I walked on Grey Street and McLean Street and Brown Street and Demet Street yeah. and, you know, uh, everything around me was named and everything around us was named by colonisers. Still is. A lot of those street names remain yeah, now. Still there. And so, <clears throat> you know, kind of coming through that and I, I guess if there was a... So there's lots of little points in there, right? Little moments. They kind of, they come to a turning point, I think, um, when something big happens. And, and the big thing that happened for me, which I've talked about on a number of occasions, is when I moved to Tamaki Makaurau um, to go to the university, uh, the first whānau I met with a hawk whānau. And so that was life-changing because all of a sudden I understood from the stories of Takapalafo and, and the occupation there and hearing Joe's stories and Rini's stories and Sharon and all of their whānau, their stories of being in that occupation and what they meant and why they did that. Mm. Everything else, all those other little moments made sense to me. All of a sudden I kind of under, in my early tw 20s I understood it. And once you open that kind of recognition, you can't shut that door, yeah. you know. Yeah. Once you walk through that door, you never go back to any other kind of understanding of the world. Yeah. Parihaka made more sense. I mean, we grew up 45 minutes from Parihaka and never went there. Wow. I went there as an adult. Yeah. Um, understanding the maunga made more sense. Why we never went onto the maunga unless we had to, unless there was a purpose. So my father would always say, you don't go on to the maunga unless you have a purpose. Which, in his way, was saying, there's got to be a kaupapa. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, he didn't just jump on any old school trip and go on the bus, you know, <laughs> uh, or go skiing or anything kind of like that, which seems very weird to me, yeah. that our maunga are considered playgrounds rather than tūpuna. Um, so all of those kind of things in my life all of a sudden made sense, almost overnight. It's just like bang. Oh, I get that. I think one of the other. I don't know how you feel about me saying this, but the, one of the real skills that you have, though, is your ability to be able to not just communicate these things with, with clarity. I, I remember you, and you may not remember, but you came to one of my. Um, I was I was doing Māori media at AUT. You actually came into a couple of Māori theory yeah. class. And I remember thinking, well, how's this going to relate? And you presented, not just with clarity, clarity and intellect, but um, 
almost your ability to mentor people through what, what that means um, is a really important thing to be able to do. And the reason why I raise it is because it's a really important thing to be able to do at the time that you were learning, but also what you do now is your ability to be able to, as I say, communicate and then mentor people through as they go through that process. And I, and I know you say we have that capability and capacity now, but that's something that you've got, which, which a lot of other, quote unquote, academics, <laughs> very good on the theory, but the ability to be able to, to, to bring people along on the journey with them, and, that, and that's a really crucial part, is bringing people along the journey with them. H how do you do that? <laughs> I know it's a really hard question, yeah. and as I say, I'm not sure how you feel about it, but, yeah. but how, do you, how do you enable that to occur? What, what do you do that makes that work for people like me? Um, so I was very well trained in it. Um, and by which I mean, you know, when I, <coughs> excuse me, started teaching, when I started teaching at the University of Auckland, I started with Linda, Grant, uh, Linda Smith, Graham Smith, Margie Hoheba, um, Kuni Jenkins, Trisha, Trisha Johnson, all these people. Was this Te Aratea Tia? Tia? <coughs> or, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, and so the Māori Ed team. Um, all, have, all who have been through, you know, establishing kohanga, yeah. uh, you know, kura, and all of those things that are very whānau based, very Māori based. And <coughs> so as an academic, what I learnt with them was actually what we do is not only, for, it's not for ourselves. What we do is for our people. And you know, <clears throat> you can get the professor title, which is useful sometimes when I'm talking to bikers, uh, <clears throat> when I need to remind them that actually there are Māori that know some things. Yeah. Um, and so it's a very strategic use of the term, except for when I meet you. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you That's and, my and own you ignorance. Have me, <laughs> you have to call me that. Um, <clears throat> but you know, that, those kind of titles are strategic. Yeah. And uh, but definitely, uh, you know, I've been very well trained um, as a researcher and as a scholar and in a way that aligns to the learnings I've been doing anyway in my own life yeah. around Kaupapa Māori. And so um, having had children in both kohanga and kura and having had that training, uh, I know that everything we do is about future generations. It's not really about us. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Which is why I have such a strong critique, I think, around things like treaty settlements. Because I, I you know, continue to see that a lot of what drives that is about a current generation. Um, and we say we're doing it for future generations, but actually we're leaving them with a <coughs> sorry, we're leaving them with a legacy of some settlements that are just wrong. Oh, there are a lot of short term there are short term yeah. decisions so, made, commercial decisions yeah. made which are three to five years. Yeah. I mean, so I mean it's around it's around those future yeah. Yeah. Um, generations. And in terms of yeah. <clears throat> in terms of what I do, that's what I do. I, I do what I can to contribute now to something better in the future. But actually, you know, I think Julian, I think every generation of Māori has done that. Mm. Like if you think about your own parents and you think about what they did to make it better for us and then you think about their parents, what they did to make it better. And so I think that every generation of whānau Māori are trying to make something better mm. for the next generation. And, and the better, the ultimate better, is a rangatiratanga, is a return of our status in our mana and our place here yeah. to where it should have been. To so, what we agree to in the in Te Tiri Te Waitangi. So, so how do you respond though when people hear that? And and you have been, um, I won't say a political commentator, but you are quoted a lot in media mm. um, around. Uh, you talk about Kopapa Māori theory, but the word that always comes out Rangatiratanga, and there is always a feeling from from, from sectors of communities that go right, they switch off when they hear that, right? Mm. And these aren't these aren't necessarily mm. people who need to hear the message, right. although some are. But I'm mainly talking about non-Māori, right? right? Some people who actually who potentially need to be on the journey as well, yeah. particularly you get an understanding of the history of yeah. relationships and 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 and, and relationships I don't care too much about them. I don't. I don't care too much about them. You know, because they are kawanatanga. And they need to initially learn their own role as kawanatanga. What I care about is whether we, as Māori, uh, know fully what rangatiratanga means for us. Because we can enact it in our lives in many ways without anything to do with the Crown. So during COVID, you saw it across the motu, 
across the motu, Māori, Māori service providers, iwi service providers, all of the Māori medical people coming together in the National Māori Pandemic Group. They had nothing to do with the Crown at all. It had nothing to do with the Ministry of Health, uh, who were very not inclusive of things Māori at the beginning. And that's not to say anything against the, you know, the leading of what needed to be done in general terms. But as Paparangi Reid said uh, very early on, one size fits all is not going to work for Māori in this pandemic. So what do we do? Our people went out, we fed our people, we cared for our people, we checked on our, our kaumātua, we did all the things, we protected communities, we put up barriers, um, we protected territories. Now in that space and within Taranaki there were a number of ways that that was done. That is about asserting ranga tiratanga, that is about the protection of our iwi boundaries of which we have a right to do as Māori, as tangata whenua. So what I'm more interested in is whether our people have a vision of rangatiratanga and what that looks like and how we can move toward that and have these little victories along the way. As Graham Smith would say, we should celebrate every victory along the way uh, because we are leading to this kind of wider, longer term vision. So in terms of how others, uh, particularly in terms of how Pākehā or the Crown or the government may perceive that, I actually don't really care too much about that. Um, <clears throat> what they need to understand is, for me, is that they are manuhiri and they need to learn to be good manuhiri and they need to be good manuhiri. And we show them that on the marae all the time. Pōhiri is a very clear example of how we come together as tangata whenua and manuhiri. And because when they come on, they become a part of us, but they don't own the marae. You know, yeah. they become a part of our community on our terms, within our tikanga. Uh, and so I think that is the role for many Pākehā, particularly, who are interested in being supportive and involved, is that they need to understand what it means to be good manuhiri and understand what it means to be uh, aligned to kāwanatanga and what that means for us. So let, let me put that question to you then, the question that you asked around, you, you're interested to see what the vision, what people, what Māori vision, what hapu vision, what whānau vision of te noranga te is. What is Professor Leonie Pihima's vision of ranga te Well, it's a vision that we had in Te 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 Waitangi. It's a vision that our tūpuna had. And when we, when we talk about future generations, which was about in 1840, you know, over 500 of our people signed a document that had a vision for us now, mm -hmm. you know. And that was to live in Aotearoa as tangata whenua. And that this is Māori land, this is iwi hapu whānau land. To live in a way that it aligns to our tikanga, to our māturanga. And for all manuhiri that come here, to also live in a way that aligns to that. To live in a way where the resources that come from this country uh, in a contemporary way now, you know, taxes, whatever, uh, are actually shared equally, equitably, between tangata whenua and kāwanatanga in doing everything we do, in everything we do. So, <clears throat> I mean, I can't finish this corner without oh, mentioning no. the Ministry of Child for Children, yeah. so, uh, which is a prime example that we have at the moment. So... One, they steal our kupu, oranga tamariki. Now, in my view, every mātanga reo should have been outraged by that and should have been out speaking against that because they are not the embodiment of oranga tamariki. You know? And so that's why I'm saying that we have to have all of these groups come together because we did need more power from those who are fluent into their māji to say, oh no, kei te <coughs> you know, You don't get to have that name, no matter who gave it to you because you don't embody that. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say, was yeah. that they probably use the mātanga reo to give it the name yeah. anyway. <laughs> so, you know, so that's one example of the manipulation of te reo Māori yeah. to serve the purpose of the Crown, not to serve any purpose of our people. Yeah. Uh, and they should really just be called what they are, which is the Ministry of Stealing Children. In my view, that's what they should be called. So we continue with that notion of the, of that particular ministry and we come into now after many years you know since Te Rangiho in the 80s and that group of people saying to them then what you're doing is destroying whānau 
You must change this. And I've had over 30 years to change and it hasn't changed. And then we come now and we, a Waitangi tribunal hearing begins around uh, you know, the abuses of the state against our whānau. Um, and we, we see the ministry coming out with a whole range of new partnership documents, new MOUs. And you know, they flaunt these partnership documents all the time. Like they name them all, all the time. You know, Waikato, mine, Ngāpuhi, yours, mm. Kaitahu. You know, they name our iwi as if our iwi somehow are in support of what they're doing, and they're not. Mm. They just have a MOU or a partnership agreement with them. Mm. But when we look at that, for me, <coughs> MOUs and partnership agreements are not rangatiratanga. No. That is not rangatiratanga. And I, I think the iwi would agree with that. That's I think right. they say it's, it's an agreement to, to work on a couple of things together, but that's not the actual, this no. isn't the actual... That's actual not the vision. Yeah. That's not the actual vision of rangatiratanga. The vision of rangatiratanga. And, and, and we do have to think how many more Māori children are going to die before we actually go all the way and say no. All of us, we stop signing agreements, we stop doing partnership agreements, and we start actually dealing to that issue directly in our own way. So we run our own interventions. Mm -hmm. We do all of that ourselves, because rangatiratanga will actually be a dismantling of that organisation right now. And the re-establishment of another organisation for Pākehā, an organisation for Pacific, and we would have our own, of which 50% of all resources from the Crown would come directly into that. That's, that's a treaty arrangement. Yeah. That's a meaningful way of being and doing things. So can, can iwi organisations, I mean, I'm, you know, I can ask this question, I've worked for iwi organisations, as mm -hmm. you know. Can iwi organisations actualise te no ranga te oh, Absolutely, yeah. They can? Yeah. There's an argument that for many people that says they can't, <laughs> well, because they, they, are, they are replicating colonial structure. It might be a different structure, but iwi itself can. You know, we've got to move away from iwi as a corporate or iwi as a post-settlement uh, entity. Yeah. Actually, we're not a post-settlement entity, we're an iwi. Yeah. And so that, when we're talking about the, you know, embodiment of mātauranga, of tikanga, of kaupapa, all of it has to be rethought. All of this notion of democratic voting has to be totally rethought. Um, but we do have the capacity, every single iwi in this country, every hapu, in fact I think it's probably more at a hapu level. Whakaputanga and Te Reti Waitangi were about hapu. No. The iwi was a strategic arrangement of hapu, right? When so required at the time that required. it was required. Yeah. And so I think that actually when we think about our tamariki, we'd better serve to be operating at a hapu, in a hapu context, because we know all the whānau that are a part of our hapu. Mm -hmm and that iwi again is strategic. So there are a whole range of ways in which all of that's been disrupted, where our way of understanding our structures has been flipped on to make iwi more important than hapu than whānau, uh, rather than iwi as being this body that supports these other two smaller units. Right? And so there's a whole lot of colonial history of that and why that happened. Um, but we, can't, we have to move away, I think, you know, from this kind of deficit idea that we have that we do more damage to ourselves than others, because we don't. Mm. We do not do more damage to ourselves and the others than others. The Crown has done more damage to our people a thousand times over than we can ever do to ourselves. Even historically, mm. even historically before the Crown, even with intertribal warfare, mm. because there were things in place that meant that we had to negotiate. We had tikanga that meant that we had to negotiate at some point. That, that things changed in line with our tikanga. Things change now and there is no alignment to our tikanga. Mm. So at least in the pre-colonial period, our people had the capacity to, um, to actually apply our tikanga to any context, which we don't have. We don't have the status or right in this world, in this country at the moment, to do that. But actually we can. So um, we, we need to stop saying, you know, that we're doing this all to ourselves. The things that we're doing in terms of what we would call lateral violence to each other, we have learnt yeah. over 200 years and we've learnt incredibly well, but we can unlearn it. And a number of providers that, you know, that I'm really privileged to work with would say, the only we can unlearn this in one generation. Yeah. 
And so, you know, I said, well, how do you know that? And, and if that's what we achieve in our generation... That's what well we can enough. achieve. And fam family do this all the time. Th this, this, is, this is exactly what you were saying to me, I think it was in 2001 at this class, and when you were talking about Kaupapa Māori in film and television, mm. you were talking about the same thing. Actually, you were espousing the same views, talking about the same conversation when you were on the board of Māori television. Yeah. And, 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 and Māori production, Māori film, Māori, Māori television... Um, um, that kind of thing, and it's the same thing that happened at Māori Television. I think of the Kohanga Hill case, right? I mean, it was it was a case of we Māori seemed to be doing it to other Māori, particularly in that Kohanga Hill case, right? Um, so, so I, I absolutely understand what you're saying, and and, and it, it, it's obviously very similar, which is why Kapapa Māori is so important. Kapapa Māori is a theory. Kapapa Māori is a framework is is really important because that's the basis for which you be able to review everything you're doing and say, right, where, how do we need to pivot or actually do a complete change of course, right? Yeah. The other part that I think is really important is because, and it's been a, a, a big part of work that you've been doing is around mana wahine theory, right? Mm. And I want, and you know, I know we've got a very short time um, um, together and I, I want to try and get an understanding of, of what that looks like, of, of, of uh, what your how you've been looking at applying manawahine theory in, in a number of various fields or, or whatever they might be, but what, what that looks like, what, what is the, the aspiration of manawahine theory that it seeks to achieve? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I mean, manawahine as a theory is really built on kaupapa Māori. So it's a yeah. form of kaupapa Māori theory. So it aligns to the same principles, but the focus on, is on what is happening to wahine, what is happening to takatāpui particularly. Yeah. Uh, and so <clears throat> it's still applying the same fundamental principles, but in a context where we know that there are vast inequities in terms of what is happening for Māori women, and where we know that colonialism has created all these mythologies about Māori women that have no basis and yet are reproduced within our own communities and often within our own people. Uh, <clears throat> and so... You know, I want to go back to the karakia one, you know, with Huirangi, because in that, in hearing him talk about that, I, what hit me was that everyone does karakia. Yeah. And I remember thinking, that's weird, because people keep saying only men do karakia. Not the done in a year. It's like, so how does that work? Yeah. Because I believe him. Yeah. You know. He knew what he was talking about. And... <laughs> and only men go into Whareiwana. And only men go into Whareiwana. Yeah. And yet all the documentation tells us that's not right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I remember when I first met uh, Dal Wihong, yeah. and her talking about Ngāpuhi, yeah. Wānanga, well, Wahine. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? And so there's just... And, and that only men do taiaha, which doesn't fit because it's always been a something that everyone has done in Pariaka. Oh, yeah. And you can say Milton, you know, Te Miringa shared that with a lot of people. Uh, Tar Taranaki through Whangaru, Whangaru, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kahunanu. Yeah, kahunanu, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and Rose Perry's talk. So all this stuff just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. That we have these prohibitions around Māori women. They just make no sense. And when you go back and you read people like Alston Best and Beryl Hewis and all those anthropologists, you see the source of that. And it's not Māori. Mm. It's their interpretation of how they viewed our woman, how they perceived our woman and how they align to a colonial view of woman of the time. Woman as property, woman as chattel, woman as lesser. And so <clears throat> this whole idea of anthropo uh, you know, early ethnographers talking about um, Māori women are nor, therefore they're common and profane. Rather than seeing, as Ani Makairi would talk about, the tapu of wahine, yeah. alongside te tapu o te tāne, yeah. te tapu o te tangata. Yeah. Like, what you're telling me that we have no tapu? Well, that doesn't. It also doesn't align to every single Māori woman I've ever met in my life, <laughs> and to certain Māori men that I would consider to be very nor. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's just <clears throat> those kind of things. And then how do they get embedded in a kind of contemporary way? Yeah. Well, you have um, within Te Matapunga, Puninga, the Karakia group, only men. That's how it gets embedded. Oh, Te Matapuninga, that's the, yeah, I don't know, the, uh, yeah, the, the karaki, came out of Te Panakiratanga, I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, and they're all men. So even with those groups, you know, <clears throat> you know, with these different groups going on, there, there are things that have become 
uh, a kind of underlying understanding about those groups. They're really not ours. They come from somewhere else. Um, but, that, but they have... We have to weed uh, it out. Uh, well, the, well, the struggle is, is that it's become so... Or, or, I won't say entrenched, but it's become so... Uh, actually, maybe entrenched is a word. People think that's the way it is. People think that's the way it is. So how, how, do, you, how do you change that? I think that you have people that just keep doing it, keep talking about it, keep doing it. Ah, ko te aha. You know, every generation there have been Māori women that have stood on Marae and been told to sit down and have ignored them, mm. including on my own in Waitara. Um, who, who was that? So it was the Latina's daughter oh, yeah. stood at Waitara when she was going into Parliament. Idi- idiaka, yeah. Idiaka. And she stood in Waitara at, Manu- at Oway. Uh, and my understanding is that when she was asked to sit down because women don't speak there, she was very clear that if I don't speak here, I will not speak for you in Parliament. Oh, Nick Minute. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, given speaking rights. Sorry. So it's... We also have in, in Taranaki, as you know, tu tama wahine i te wao te So our wahine have always done what is required to be done for the well-being of our people. Um, that comes directly from Pariaka. And um, in my own experience has meant that I have stood at different tangi to kōrero, to whai kōrero, yeah. uh, going on with a group of wahine and, and being supported in that by people who have been there, like people like Iruakiri, Horioka, people like that, yeah. uh, who will say themselves, tu tama wahine i te wao te So it is around acknowledgement that there are many ways, a hapu a iwi, that we think about these things in terms of the place of women, uh, the role of wahine, the role of takatāpui within our communities. Um, that, you know, we need to constantly be reflecting on and thinking about where did this really come from? Where did this really come from? There's been lots of examples. I think during the uh, period of lockdown, during COVID, when um, Panya and Padalni and others did... Te koko muka. Yeah. From here, from Mahidahi Media, yeah. yeah. And when they, uh, there was a, the one they did on Tangihana. And it was, I mean, you know, really important wānanga. You know, the, the only way we could wānanga online uh, during a time where we couldn't be kanohi ki te kanohi. Um, and so... Those, I thought that that series raised a whole lot of critical issues for us, for us to think about, uh, and everyone did. But one of the ones that really hit me when I'm thinking about Manawahini was at one point when Pani was talking about mina he, um, so when you have your reading atua, when your women are bleeding, which we should not call mate because we're not dying and we're not sick, right? Um, that you stay outside the fence. And I remember her making a comment like, how powerful that fence must be to stop my wairua from going any further. Uh, yeah. That Pākehā constructed fence. <laughs> yeah. So you stand outside the fence because you're bleeding, you can't go inside because of wairua things. So when does a concrete fence stop wairua? Mm. You know, and actually I hadn't heard anyone talk about it like that. I'd always been really challenged by that idea. Yeah. And I thought, she is so right. How yeah. does a fence change a demarcation actually, of where you can be and not be? Actually, it's the other way around. <laughs> um, not, not in that instance, but I remember Whare Huia talking about kua rai awakoe, and it's about kōrero about when, when someone stands at the door that, that you need to let the, the reringa atua Go so so it's it's the reading ko te reading atua te mana orunga ko te tanga tanga ina ro you know um, yeah it's an it's an interesting concept and and uh, you know I think um, it's interesting they they started having these conversations uh, up home about why is our technology not the way that it is mm. you know who well, well who said it's this way it's this way because of that, that, that 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 and you have these these conversations the problem I wonder though is whether or not people if and you, cr- you try and create the space for these things to occur, mm. to have these really kind of integral, really meaningful conversations about these kind of, about, about tikanga, quote unquote. 
Um, but very little still changes. Mm. Very little still changes. And I wonder, so you can create the space, you can have the conversation, but how do you affect the change? Well, it has to be intergenerational. It can't just stay in the conversation in that area of those people at that time. It actually has to be passed on. Any change between generations has to be passed on through the generations. And so, and, and the meaning of that. You know, when I think about, you know, someone like Hidden uh, Mokko Mead, and when he writes about tikanga, and the fundamental is to do what is tikka yeah. of the time, in the time. So is it tikka in the time to not have a tangi for someone so renowned? Well, actually, during that time, it was tikka. So it was a form of tikanga because it was tikka. Why? Because to do anything else would be to endanger an entire hapu, and actually would have endangered every Māori in this country had we all gone, had we all gone to Hawera for a tangi for huirangi. And that whānau knew, the whānau knew that, and the hapu knew that, and the marae knew that. So was that tikanga? Well, it was, given it was tika. So when we think about it, in that way, then tikanga is going to, is flexible, is moving, is changing. It doesn't mean the foundations of the understanding of the values change, they don't. Yeah. And so, you know, having marae online as a way to puru puru aki kiaia, um, that was a way of utilising what we had at hand to do the tikanga in a way that was tika and puno for the whole of Aotearoa and we could all watch that and we could all be a part of that through the people who spoke. And so, is it how our tūpuna would have, would have envisaged? No. But had they known COVID and the internet and Wi-Fi? Probably yes. They probably would have done it. And so, you know, it is around thinking, is this tikka in this time? And, and that means thinking about the things that are not tikka that have come from colonialism, that, that actually do benefit certain groups of people. So there are certain wealthier people within our own people that benefit from the treaty settlement process. We know that. Is that tikka? No, it's not tikka. Does it have to change? Yes, it does. That has to change. There are certain Māori men that benefit from the oppression of Māori women. Is that tikka? No, it's not. That has to change. But we all have to change it. It can't be constantly Māori women knocking on the door, yeah. saying, excuse me, but you know, you're wānanga. We used to be here 150 years ago. Why can't we be here now? Um, you know, I think that we need to move past that and yeah. actually re be more reflective, be more decolonising and think about what is tika in this context. And that is not only in a big iwi way, but it's also in our whānau way. It's also in how we live. You know, Fano was four, three, four generations. Yeah. We live in a very nuclearised way. We live in a way where we're constantly thinking, when our kids grow up, we'll have our life back. Well, actually, for Māori, for many, when our kids grow up, we just get the mokopuna move in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And we love it. Yeah. We love it. I remember being told it wasn't, uh, you, you know, by a queer. It was really when I became, uh, had my first mokopuna that I knew what it meant, my, what my role was, you know. And so we have, we're constantly battling all these belief systems that we're told, you know, we have to follow and make sure we don't have to follow them. And it gets very tiring. I think our people are exhausted following them. And I think our people were exhausted in the treaty process. I know in Waitara, in terms of the lands issues, that the hapu of Te Atiawa were exhausted by the constant bashing of the crown. And, and so you see a, a legislation go through to freehold the land with these nice little committees and putia. Well, actually, that was never, that was never the vision of our tūpuna. Yeah. And yet I can understand that those leading that fight were battered down the crown batters us down every day of our lives. And it's such a massive beast. It's, it's got all the resources, all the armoury. Yeah. And the other thing is, is that after three years it changes. Okay. And the institutional memory is gone and then they go and do the same thing. And we have to deal with another group. But, you know, so in some ways when I was saying to you before, I really don't care what they think. Yeah. It does come down to what is consistent here. We are. Who never leaves? I mean, individuals go anywhere, away. Yeah. We're not going anywhere. Yeah. We are not, we're here forever. Yeah. We've been here forever. 
we are here forever and we'll, you know, our children, our mokopana, will be here forever. So we just go keep doing the long vision, uh, keep trying to live our lives the way we can live them. You know, so much has changed, we know that, in our lifetime. So much has changed. And yet so much remains the same, don't Yet so much remains <laughs> the same. But the changes have not come from the crown, and, and I think we need to really remember that. When I get up in the morning and my, moko kana, my mokopuna comes in to me, she says, kui, ka haere o ki te e You know? That is something I never heard as a child, ever. Never heard anything like that as a child. And now I have mokopuna that, you know, ko te reo Māori te reo, tana reo, anake. Um, and five of them doing that. So that has changed dramatically. In a relatively fa fairly short period of time. In a relatively short period of time. But not because of the Crown. Not no. because of the Crown made Te Reo Māori compulsory, which they still haven't. Not because they gave us a lot of money for kohanga, because they still underfunded. Not because of anything. But what we've done. Everything we've done with limited resources to be where we are. So that you have tamariki that kore Reo Māori. They didn't have to wait till high school to begin to learn. So I have mokopuna that call it all Māori. They didn't have to wait till their mid-twenties to even hear te reo Māori. Uh, and we've done that. And we should rejoice in that. We should be happy for that. We should celebrate that. And we should say, actually, we've done an amazing job. And you wait to see what's going to happen in 30 years' time when all those speakers of te reo Māori, which we see now, we see now people like Jade, mm. Mahanga, you know, leading, leading institutions, Raukura of, 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 you know, of Kura Kaupapa Māori and others who haven't been through Kura Kaupapa Māori but have led through with Te Reo Māori in their own way. Um, they, they are changing the landscape of the world here in Aotearoa and our role, I think, is to continue to support them doing that. 30 years' time is going to look very different. I mean, I'd like to be here to see how it looks in 30 years' time. Um, but I think we have to keep celebrating, keep doing the fight, keep working together, keep having deep aroha for each other, you know, in our professional relationships, in our working relationships, in our friendships, in our whānau. Keep thinking about our own way of how am I being tika today? <laughs> to myself, to my whānau, to my people. Uh, and, you know, and I think this is why I love Kaupapa Māori, Julian. I mean, I, I remember... I can't even remember when it was when all of a sudden I thought, yep, that's it. All of these principles of Kaupapa Māori, they embody everything. Everything that we need to understand what is happening to us is embodied in this framework. And so you know, we have really amazing people to thank for that. Many, many amazing people. Um, someone who I think has, was always under-celebrated under was Tuki Nipi oh, yeah. and the work that she did around Te Ahumatua and Kura Kaupapa Māori. Yeah. But not just Kura Kaupapa Māori. Kaupapa Māori was before Kura Kaupapa Māori. Yeah. Kaupapa Māori has been a part of our lives, mai mm. and we're just learning how to you know, integrate that now and live with that in our lives. So for me, there's no, actually no other way. No. There's no other way. Kaupapa Māori is the way. Tikanga reo mātauranga Māori is the way. And then as we do that, we can then look at other things that are happening for us, which I think it comes down to a kind of another layer of our own personal relationships. Because I think that is an area, working, in, working with people who do family violence prevention and intervention, is that really deeply embedded, how do we relate to each other? That I think is a layer that we need to really work on. Uh, because we do things in relationships that are not ticker that we would not do to other people. And so, and I think that is a colonial outcome because I think we've been raised in a belief system of relationships look like this. Uh, and so there are layers of it that, that we're working through. Um, and, 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 yeah. we'll continue, and we'll continue to work through. Hey, I, I said there were going to be about five other things we were going to talk about right. and we'll save them for part two. <laughs> but thank, you, thank you for being a part of Indigenous 100. I didn't even get to the Fulbright Scholarship in 2011 when you were in the US, so that's why I say there's probably going to be a part two and a part three. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Stop you. Tēnā koe. Whaiwahi mai koe ia matau. E te 
Ahora ni. Nada me hinduja. Ah, tiene nada. Nada.